Aloha. It is so fantastic to be here in Hawaii with all of you. And uh, we're excited to be back with so many friends. It's amazing as we come up in the fellowship. I say, it's nice to meet you. And then we realize, no, we know each other. We've met before. Uh, I just want you to know it's not because you look any older. It's just been a while. That's all. So it's great to be with all of you. And thank you so much for welcoming us with such a warm and open heart. Well, aloha, it's been amazing, and it's so great to see so many of your faces that we've known over the years, and um, especially when we were in Tokyo and visited here, and then it's great to be with Son and Anthony, especially special friends, amazing people, amazing leaders, and we're so grateful for you guys, and it's just so great to be with all of you. Amen. Well, I wanted to, Erica to uh, introduce our family to all of you tonight. Uh, since we're, this is the family conference, right? Okay, so so maybe we should get to know you as a family. I think I have this on, and let's see if it works. This is the, uh, oh, there it is. Yes. There's our family. Yay. So, um, so that about down, starting from the bottom, on the left-hand side is Mimi, our baby. And um, she's at Tufts University, and she's finishing out her um, senior year. And um, she just took the MCAT and did really well on it. She's planning to be a doctor and um, doing awesome. She leads a Bible talk um, over at Harvard as well as at Tufts. So she's, she's um, just very involved um, as a disciple. And then next to her is Manami, our second daughter. And um, she's holding um, her daughter, Emmy. And she, um, Emmy is two, uh, two years and eight months old. And then she also just had another baby, which um, I'll show you in a second. <laughs> um, but um, Emmy is just a rambunctious, fun grandchild. I love being a gra grandma. Baba. I'm Baba, for those of you who are Japanese and know Obacha. So, and then right up. Uh, Above Mimi is her husband, Ross, and they're both in the full-time ministry in the New York City Church of Christ, and they're um, evangelist and women's ministry leader, um, helping out with the youth and family ministry. So, and then in near the center is um, Miyoko, our oldest, and um, she is um, 30, oh, I didn't say her age. I saw Manami is thir almost 30, and then Miyoko is 32. And she has a little boy, same age as Emmy, almost. They're two weeks apart. So you can imagine I was super busy going back and forth trying to help both um, daughters having their babies. And she has a little boy, Lincoln. And uh, Miyoko is uh, working um, for GE Medical. She's in charge. She does what she is is called the big deal person. I don't know, it's a funny title, but she is in charge of G Medical for the West Coast and the mountain region of the U.S. And so she's traveling a lot, so I get to watch Lincoln a lot, and it's really great. And, um, and then right above her is Jason in the center of the men, and that's her husband, and he just finished his MBA and is, good, is working with Frank at Pactimo, and he is, you know how we were talking about the next generation? Well, he's going to hopefully in the future take over as CEO of Pactimo um, after Frank can get his uh, retirement and relax with me and have fun and just travel, <laughs> which <Hawaii>. is, <laughs> and that's what we want to do. And then there's me and Frank, and Frank is an awesome husband. You are in for a treat, you guys. He is an amazing husband, amazing grandfather and um, amazing businessman and I love him to death and you're gonna just have a great time listening to him thank you guys great job. <laughs> okay well good evening again uh, Eric and I want to say a very special uh, word of thanks to Anthony and Son uh, Anthony was very kind in terms of uh, describing uh, some of our interactions and our relationship through the years. Uh, I do want to say that uh, I grew my hair long so that you could separate us because I know we look so much alike. Uh, actually, I always felt like it was kind of an insult to Anthony that anyone would think he was me because he's so much better looking, more athletic, more talented in so many ways. And so Anthony, uh, I'm sorry that that has happened to you 
over the years, and please keep your self-esteem up despite all of that. Um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it is true that Eric and I met them when they were very, very young, uh, in college and uh, just out of college, actually. And uh, Anthony was uh, going to be a doctor. Son had become a nurse. And uh, then the ministry called them into a different direction. And uh, since that time, they've been used by God uh, to go through to uh, Manila and uh, Thailand and in L.A. and now here in, in Hawaii. And uh, Eric and I have a very strong belief that it is exciting to have incredibly talented and gifted people like uh, Tui and Kira and Anthony and Son who give their lives to be able to lead the church so that, uh, so that we can follow their leadership and support them and, and see God use them to help grow his kingdom in the places in which we live. So for Son and Anthony, I just want to say we're so proud of you. The friendship that we share with you is for, yeah, forever. And the, the closest that we share with you, the respect that we have for you, the love that we feel towards you is just very, very deep. And so this is a very special blessing and a treat to be with you here in Hawaii. So thank you very much for having us here. And thank you all of you for having us here. Well, are you ready for the weekend? I would like to ask you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 10. And uh, I think I forgot to advance the slide because, uh, let's see. I forgot to introduce someone. I'm going to do it real quick. Can I go backwards? That's our youngest grandchild. It's a grandson named Thor. I am not joking. His name is Thor. Now, I want you to keep in mind that his father is an evangelist in the New York City Church. And when he called and said, we're going to name our son Thor, it was, you know, with a, with a son-in-law, you got to be careful. But inside of my heart, I thought, you're a minister of the gospel, and you're going to name your son after a Norse god. <laughs> but he did, and thankfully, Thor came out rather large. That's thankfully because you don't want to go to school with a name like Thor and be small. That doesn't work. So anyways, on to tonight's message. John chapter 10. What a weekend we have ahead of us. We have themes like this is life tonight. This is us tomorrow. On Sunday, this is love. These are huge topics, aren't they? How many movies, how many shows, how many books, how many conversations have been driven by these ideas and these concepts? I would say that every human dream, every human plan, and every relationship somehow derives itself from these ideas, these themes. And in a few minutes we're going to be able to spend together this weekend. The few minutes, the few hours that we're going to spend together. There's no way that we're going to be able to delve into everything that these topics and these issues comprise. But hopefully, and this is my hope, we'll be able to get all of us thinking about these things in a deeper way. We'll get our conversations going. We'll open up our hearts like never before to these areas. And most importantly, what I'm really hoping is that this weekend is going to take every single one of us back to the source of everything that is true and that is real in life. And that's Jesus Christ. Amen? So, let's go to the Gospel of John and let's read together in verses 7 through 11. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out, and they will find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus said, I have come to give them life so that they may have it to the full. This is good news. Amen? This is great news. It's an amazing promise. The Son of God, he says to us, listen, I have come to give you an abundant, fulfilled life. What an amazing vision for our lives. This is what God wants for us. But I don't want us to miss the warning that he also has. Jesus clearly warns us that there is a counterfeit life. 
He says there's a fake life. And that fake life is going to steal your joy. It's going to kill your dreams. And it's going to destroy your eternity. You know, Anthony referred to the fact that we used to travel together in Southeast Asia. And I remember going with Anthony on my first visit to Phnom Penh, Cambodia. At that time, it was in the early 90s, and they had just been through two decades of civil war, brutal civil war, and a bloody genocide at the hands of the Khmer Rouge. At that time, Cambodia was regarded as one of the, if not the, poorest nations on earth. There was no public transportation at the time. And so I remember that we were just riding motorbikes to get from place to place. And at one point, we stopped at the National Pediatric Hospital. It was just a small little concrete building by the side of the road. And we went in, and it was there. It was built to basically take care of about 40 patients. There, there must have been 100 to 150 kids in the building at the time. They were lying on the floor on dirty mats with their mothers. There were flies flying around. We had a doctor with us. And he was uh, looking at one of the whiteboards there, chalkboards, and he said, these kids are dying of simple conditions like diarrhea. Mothers looked at Anthony and I, and because we were foreigners, they might have thought we were doctors, so they were bringing their babies up to us, holding them up to us. We didn't understand what they were saying. We couldn't do anything for them. It was hard. I remember watching a mother as she sat on one bed by herself, alone, weeping, crying. No words were needed. We knew exactly what had happened. I remember that day being in that hospital. I vowed, I prayed in my heart, God, help us to do something. I wasn't a doctor. I wasn't a medical professional. I didn't know how he was going to answer that prayer. But I just knew that God needed to do something. Well, only a few years later, God opened an incredible door. I had a friend in Tokyo. I made a friend in Tokyo who was a very famous American journalist for magazines like Forbes magazine, Fortune magazine. And he wanted to start a hospital in Cambodia because he had friends who were Cambodian. Eventually, he was able to put together a network of relationships with Japanese companies and generous founders, uh, f uh, funders, and he built a hospital in Cambodia, in Phnom Penh. But he had no one to staff it. And right around that time, we met. We became friends. I introduced him to Hope Worldwide, and that hospital eventually became the Sihanouk Hospital Center of Hope. And it was through the miraculous power of God and the incredible faith and courage of unbelievable men and women of Christian faith that almost two million patients have been helped in that facility to this day. Is that amazing? That hospital is now the leading outpatient medical facility in the country of Cambodia. Now, several years after that hospital was opened, I was touring the inpatient ward one day with some disciples, and I met a young woman who was lying in a bed, and she could not speak. And apparently, they told me that this woman was near death. Basically, it almost died, except that she had been brought to the hospital, and her life was saved. So I said, what happened? Well, what they told me was that this woman had picked up a bottle of water because she was thirsty, and she had taken a huge gulp. But what happened was that what she drank was not a bottle of water. She drank instead a bottle of acid. And basically, the acid had burned her entire esophagus and parts of her digestive system from the inside out. At that time, Cambodians used to use these old empty bottles to store everything from gasoline to cooking items. She had no idea what she was drinking at the time, and when she drank it down, it almost killed her. She thought she was drinking water, but instead she was drinking poison. Now, we all know that true water is refreshing, especially on a hot day. True water is nourishing. We cannot live without it. True water gives us life. Now, acid can look like water. It may be clear like water. It may be in a container just like water. But ultimately is not water. It does not give life. It burns, it destroys, and it kills. Tonight we're going to talk about the topic, this is life. Here's the fact. Every one of us in this room, we have one life to live. Everyone has one chance at this thing we call life. And during our time on earth, 
finding true life, finding real life, is perhaps the most critical, the most essential, the most important mission of any human being. Some of us are old enough to remember when Coca-Cola had that sort of jingle. The real thing, what the world wants today. Now I think all of us are now have become more health conscious. We realize that in every can of Coke there's 10 teaspoons or tablespoons of refined sugar. There's corn syrup, that's phosphoric acid so that we don't vomit from drinking so much sugar. And a variety of other chemicals that can kill you over time. The real thing. You can call it what you want. It can look like something good, but in the end, it can kill you. Do you remember that? That's the lesson. So many options in this life will call themselves true life. But we need to find the real thing. And the saddest thing in this life is not dying. Life is so much more than the number of days that we have. True life is much more than the length of it. The saddest thing in life is facing death and realizing that the life you lived was not real. That it wasn't based on truth. That all your efforts, that all your sacrifice and all your energy was based on a lie, on the wrong values, the wrong goals. The good news tonight is that God wants us to have a real life. God wants us to have true life an abundant life, and a full life, and that's great news. So tonight I have some very simple points. Number one, true life is found in Christ. I think this is working. There you go. How are you doing back there? Thank you for your help. True life is found in Christ. I'll just tell you when to change. <laughs> The Apostle John wrote several parts of the uh, New Testament, and uh, we're going to spend some time with him this weekend, okay? And uh, he's a great place to start our study tonight because John was very focused on the topic of life. I don't know if you know this, but in the Gospel, John mentions life 43 times. In his letters, in only seven chapters, John mentions it 12 times. In Revelation, he writes of life 18 times. That's a total of 73 times that John refers to life. So he's kind of an expert. So let's go ahead and read what he talks about in his gospel about life. Some of the passages. Let's go to this slide. In John chapter 3, verse 16, John said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. In John 4, verses 13 through 14, he says, Whoever drinks the life I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In John 6, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And then in John 1, verse 4, in him was life. Next slide, please. And that life is the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Next slide. Christ is life. In a world of darkness, Jesus is more than just a light. He is the light. He is the only true light. You know, soon after that visit, I remember we started a church in Phnom Penh. Now, I remember studying the Bible with friends in Cambodia in the early 1990s. They had watched their parents slaughtered. Many of them have lost all their family members. I remember meeting a clinical psychiatrist from a Harvard-sponsored clinic in Western Cambodia, and he told me that at the time they considered Cambodia have the highest rate of mental illness in the world. And I remember struggling while I studied the Bible with these friends. How can I relate to someone whose life I cannot even imagine. But what I realized was this, even if I couldn't relate, every one of the people that I studied the Bible with, they could relate to Jesus Christ. Because you see, Jesus was also slandered. He was also unjustly accused. Jesus was also tortured. He was killed. And then Jesus rose again. 
He overcame death with life. He loved his enemies. He overcame hatred. He changed the world. He is the light. In a dark world, Jesus shined. And no darkness could overcome him. I've also studied the Bible with first world millionaires who are incredibly smart and gifted. And yet when it came to relationships, when it came to purpose, when it came to meaning or eternity, they were totally in the dark. I will never forget this one guy I studied with. Middle-aged guy, been very successful in his life. He was brilliant, but he was so blind. Basically, he lost his marriage. He lost his relationship with his kids. And we sat at this cafe, and we were talking. And I finally pushed my chair back, and I said, when you look back at your life, what do you think went wrong? He stopped, and he looked down, and this is what he said. He goes, Frank, it's the real estate market. If only property values had not dropped so much, everything in my life would be different. No money, no education, no position, no title, no success can replace the truth and the light of Jesus Christ. There is so much darkness in this world around us, isn't there? There's so much darkness in our society. I don't know about you, but every day when I read the news, I get a little bit discouraged. I read and we hear and we watch stories of fear and evil and how it's ripping us apart. I am so proud of our church in Denver. This last month, we've done a sermon series called Taboo. And every week, we're talking about a different theme, a different topic that is naturally considered somewhat taboo to talk about in church. So a couple weeks ago, we did racism and diversity. Last week, same such attraction. This week, we're doing mental and emotional health. Two weeks ago, I was so proud of our church when Hispanic, Asian, and black brothers and sisters got up and they shared their stories of racism, both outside the church and insensitivity inside the church. One woman from the neighborhood just came in and she sat through church service and she was blown away and said, I've never heard anything like that in church before in my life. I will be back. I was really humbled last week and moved. One of the sisters stood up and she shared in front of hundreds of people about her sexual abuse from the time she was six years old all the way through her teenage years and how it almost destroyed her sexual identity in her life. I was also very, very moved by a brother who got up and shared about being a son, a husband, a father, and a grandfather. And how before he met Christ, he was so distraught over gender identity that he basically had prepared for a suicide. It was incredible to hear their stories. There were tears in the audience. I remember one of them sharing about the fact that they still had the bullet that they had prepared so that they could take their own life. It was incredibly powerful to see their changed lives and to see them now filled with hope, with love, passion, and purpose, because they had met Jesus Christ. You know, the world is lost in its hatred, in its prejudice, in its darkness. But in our world, Jesus Christ, he shines. He shines like a light. And the darkness will not overcome it. Because true and real life is found in Jesus Christ. Amen? But how about us? Us who are disciples. Have we drifted away from the real life, from the true life, only found in Christ? You know, just this last, I've been, this last month, I've been spending a lot of time talking and praying with one of my best friends. He is a faithful man who has done so much for our church, and I respect him. But he's been unable to sleep for days, even weeks, because he's overwhelmed with anxiety. You see, he has a huge business transaction going on. And he's just moved into a beautiful new home. And he's plagued with fear and worry that things aren't going to work out. I have another friend who has what looks to be a perfect family that belongs on a magazine cover. She comes from a dysfunctional childhood. She grew up with several brothers and sisters, each from a different father. She'll often say, my mother loved men more than she loved her kids. Praise God, this sister and her husband, 
they became Christians when they were young parents. And they were blessed with these very beautiful children. And the, she loved them, but she began to try to control them because she so desperately wanted to give them the perfect life that she didn't have that her controlling nature began to just come out. And her controlling nature basically has helped to drive her kids to deceit and basically the rejection of the faith that she dosed so desperately wants to give them. I can relate to my friends. I remember when I got out of the full-time ministry and I had no job. I was 42. I had no income. I had no experience outside of what I had done for 20 years. I remember lying in bed at 2 in the morning, unable to sleep, looking out at the streetlight thinking, how am I going to support my family? I praise God for his faithfulness. He has blessed Eric and I more than we could have asked for or imagined. And I'm grateful for that. But I've got to confess, even after he blessed us for years, I struggled because I couldn't enjoy it. I couldn't rest in it because deep down inside, I was scared. I was so scared to lose it again. So I was holding on. I was active in church. I was reaching out to my friends. But deep down inside, I was holding on tightly to something other than the only true life. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? So here's what I had to ask myself. Is Jesus my real life? comes down to this question. Oh, no, you got to go back. Is Jesus enough? You see, I realized that the only way that I was ever going to experience the joy of God's blessing is that I had to know that, Jesus, that God would be enough, that Jesus would be enough, even if I lost those blessings. Let me say that again. Listen. The only way that we can fully experience the joy of God's blessings is if we know that God is enough even if we lose those blessings. The only way for that brother of mine to find peace in the storm of his anxiety is when he can truly know that Jesus is enough even if he loses it all. The only way for that sister to find the peace to stay emotionally connected with her kids is if Jesus is enough for her, even while they're on their prodigal journey. Do you understand what I'm saying? You see, we got to get real here as disciples. Is Jesus really the center of our lives? Is he truly our life? Or is he just something that we do while we live for, while we work for, while we invest in, and while we're worried about our actual lives out there? Marriage, family, work, kids, health, home, job, these are all very, very important. But ultimately, we need to remain convinced that these are not our real life. They don't give us life. Jesus said, I am the water. Jesus said, I am the bread. He said, I am the light. I am life. So tonight, look in your hearts. Let us all look in our hearts and answer this question. Is Jesus enough for me? Because true life is found in Jesus, and he will test us. And when we pass the test, we can fully enjoy the life that he's given us. My second point tonight is that life in Christ is lavished with love. Remember John chapter 10? He said, so that we might have life and have it to the full. I'd like to ask the ushers, they're going to pass out a little present that I brought to you from Colorado. It's very special. You're going to be blown away. They're going to pass these little baggies through the aisles. And your only mission is to take two. Put it aside and keep listening to me. Got that? Take two, put it aside, keep listening to me. Thank you. So... In John chapter 10, 
uh, Jesus said, he came so that we might have life and have it to the full. Now, sometimes what I like to do is uh, I like to round out my understanding of a certain passage in the Bible by reading it in different ver versions or different translations. You ever do that? Okay, so I want to read to you a couple of translations of John chapter 10, verse 10 of this passage. It says here in the New Living Translation, But I came so that my sheep will have life and so that they will have everything they need. How about this one? My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I want you to smile while I'm reading these. This is good news. I came so that they could have life, yes, and have it full to overflowing. Now, this is my favorite one. It's something I never read before called the Passion Translation. Let's get that passion going. I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness until you overflow. Does that sound good? That sounds pretty amazing to me. But you know what? This life gets even better because John actually refers to this life in his first letter in verse 3 he says what great love the father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God now I want you to think for a moment about this word lavish this word lavish here's the dictionary definition of it bestow something in generous or extravagant quantities cover something thickly or liberally spend or give in profusion does that sound pretty awesome here are some synonyms of lavish. This is not mine. This is the dictionary. Gorgeous, opulent, grand, splendid, generous, bountiful, abundant, plentiful. This is the life that God wants to give us. In fact, lavish itself comes from the French word laver, which means to wash. Literally, God takes his blessings, and he wants to wash you in his blessings. He wants to wash you in his love, wash you in his grace. Now, I want you to think about some of the promises that Jesus gave us. In Matthew 6, remember he said, all these things will be given to you? All these things. In Matthew chapter 19, do you remember what he said? He said, you will be given 100 times as much. Now, I've been in business for a while. If you get a return of 10%, that's good. 20%, that's great. If you get, you know, 50%, that's a 100 times. That's amazing. That was Jesus' promise. In John 14, he said, we will do even greater things than him. In 2 Corinthians 9, Paul writes, we'll be enriched in every way so that we can be generous on every occasion. Do you know what that means? He goes, I'm going to give you so much that no matter how much you give away, you're going to have more. In Galatians 5, he said, Christ has set us free. 2 Peter 1, that we have everything we need to live a godly life. And these are just a few. So basically, what do we see? God has promised us an abundant, full, rich, satisfying, more than you could ever imagine or hope for in your wildest dreams kind of life. It's pretty awesome, right? And as I thought about that, I thought, you know what? Therein lies the problem, doesn't it? Because that's not what we always experience. You see, we're ready for the abundant life. We're excited about the abundant life. We welcome the abundant life. But that's not always what we experience. Instead, we experience children who reject our faith. Instead, we experience not finding that true love. No matter how hard we pray and how desperately we long for it. We go through physical sicknesses and challenges that hinder us from serving Christ the way we just know we should. Even though we pray, we believe, and we hope, and we pray, and we pray, and we pray. We mourn the death of the one person that we needed for security and comfort. Or perhaps we feel betrayed or hurt by those we call brother and sister. And that difference between what we expected and what we experience is that space in which 
disappointment, frustration, numbness, and bitterness take root. We may not quit coming to church. We may not stop giving or serving in our different roles. But so often in our heart, we really quit believing that God's life is abundant. That is lavish. That it's out of this world amazing. Now I think about the Apostle John. When he met Jesus as a young man, the Bible tells us that he was ambitious. So what kind of life was he dreaming about? Well, we read that he was dreaming about position and status and sitting at the right hand of the king. And instead, what happened? For the next 50 or 60 years of his life, he lost all his worldly possessions. He saw his brother killed. All his friends were murdered. He was constantly persecuted, probably beaten on numerous occasions. And his reward in his old age for shepherding churches was to be exiled to a rocky, old, penal colony island called Patmos. And yet, John remained faithful. And not only did he remain faithful, but he was more passionate at the end of his life and sincere and full of life at the end of his walk with Christ than he was at the beginning. And how did he do it? How did he stay on fire? How did he keep that passion? Well, let's read in Revelation 21. I think we get a little vision of that. In Revelation 21, and it's too long, so you've got to read it in your own Bibles, which I know you have. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Look what he says in verse 7. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. You know, in the midst of his suffering and exile, sitting on that island alone, looking back at a long life of sacrifice, and of giving, and hardship, I wonder if John began to doubt sometimes. He began to wonder, was it worth it? Was this really what I signed up for? It would only be human if he was like that. But you know, God showed him a vision on that island. And in that vision, John saw the big picture of his life. And he realized how amazing God's plan is. And at that point, rather than trust his own expectations of how life should be, John was able to put his faith in God's plan and God's wishes, and God's vision, and it gave him energy, and passion, and life. Now, I want you to take out those little pieces that you got. You got them? What are they? Wow, you're so smart. They're puzzle pieces! You're welcome. It's a great gift. Well, basically, I'm going to tell you the story behind this gift. You know, we have some friends, and every Christmas, their family gets together, and they build a a puzzle. And uh, we go over every Christmas and we celebrate Christmas with them at some point and we see the puzzle on the table and Eric and I are really into family traditions. So a couple of years ago we said, you know what? We need a new family tradition for Christmas. We're going to start making a puzzle with our family. So we were all excited about this and uh, we went out and we made mistake number one. We bought a thousand piece puzzle. <laughs> Big mistake. So we Announced it to the kids. We're all excited. And it was a couple of days before Christmas. And this is how we were going to spend the Christmas season this year. So we poured the puzzle pieces out and we started building. A thousand pieces is a lot of pieces. And you know, after a couple of days, the kids go, we're out. But you know, Eric and I, we want to serve as an example of perseverance and discipline to our kids. And so we were determined to see the job through the end. Well, Christmas came and Christmas went, but the puzzle was not done. And then New Year's came and New Year's went 
And yet the puzzle was not done. You know, I had to go back to work. And I started having trouble falling asleep at work. Why? Because I was staying up until 1 or 2 in the morning with Eric every night, trying to put that stupid puzzle together. And I remember, it must have been two weeks later, when about 1 or 2 in the morning, we finally got the last piece to fit in the puzzle. And we were fired up. It was like, awesome, we won the Super Bowl or something like that, you know? And we never did a puzzle again. It was totally one and done. That tradition, that was done. So I asked you a question. Have you ever done a jigsaw puzzle? Not too many. You're smarter than us. Okay, good. How do you do a puzzle? Well, you got, yeah, you do the border first and all that. But there's an important piece that comes before you do the border. All right, let's look, let's look. Hey, you got to look at the front of the box. This is your gift from Colorado. You see, you look at the front of the box. How often do you look at the front of the box? Yeah, yeah, you put it right there. It's like over and over and over and over again. And every time you look at a piece, what do you do? You look back at the box. How does it fit into the big picture? Do you understand what I'm saying? And eventually, what happens? You, you know, you go through these phases in building a puzzle like this, don't you? Aren't you, do you ever get convinced that a piece is missing? You just know that the factory shipped the box with a piece missing. Or you get a piece and you go, this is the wrong piece. How do they put a piece for another puzzle into my box, right? But in the end, you finally persevere and at one in the morning, you go, oh, they all fit. They all belong in the puzzle. Here's the other thing about the puzzle. You need every piece to complete it, don't you? Without the pieces that you got in your hand, this beautiful picture cannot be complete. In the Christian life, the key is that you got to stay focused on the front of the box. You got to stay focused on the big picture that God has for your life. How do you experience the abundance that he promised? How do you enjoy the fullness that he promised? How can you really feel and experience the lavishness that God wants to give you? Despite the disappointments. Despite the hurt. Despite the challenge. Despite the disappointments and the frustrations. How do you do that? You've got to keep your eyes and your heart focused on on God's big plan for your abundant life. Now, I want you to take those pieces out. Hold one in your right and one in your left. And I want you to look at the piece in your right. And I want you to imagine, that's the best day of your life. Think about it. What's the best day of your life? That's the one in your right hand. You know, is it a child being born? Is it the day, by a miracle, brothers, that you were actually married? The day you got baptized. That's the best day of your life. Now I want you to look at the piece in your left hand. That's the worst day of your life. I want you to think about it. Some people are laughing. But I want you to think about that death. Maybe it's the death. Maybe it's the disappointment. Maybe it's when you heard what someone said about you. That's the worst day of your life. Now, I want you to answer this question. Which one of those two pieces is more important? Which one of those pieces is more essential to God's plan for you? It's pretty clear, right? Without either, God's plan would be incomplete. You see, when we see the big picture, when we see God's vision for our lives, when we understand and trust in the fact that he knows better than us, we can't see past the corner, but he sees the entire arc of who we're going to become. At that point, we understand that every blessing and every challenge is a piece of God's amazing vision for our life. That everything has a part and a role to play. 
And so tonight, are we convinced that every day, all days, the good and the bad, the blessed and the challenging, that every one of them fits into God's plan for us? You know, 36 years ago, when I met Erica, my wife, she was this beautiful, brilliant daughter of one of the most successful doctors in America. The fact that she fell in love with me is clear proof that there is a God and that he can do anything, even make intelligent people temporarily insane. And you know, Erica's dream was to be a doctor like her father. Eventually, we were married. We decided that we would become missionaries and that we were going to change the world by changing hearts with the gospel. Now, Erica's mother had a very debilitating condition called lupus. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Lupus doesn't have a cure. And she took, for many, many years, very heavy medication. And eventually, as a result of that, she started to exhibit emotionally unbalanced tendencies and became suicidal. While Erica was still in high school, she used to spend many, many hours trying to encourage her mother, trying to take care of her, and even at college would call her every day to make sure that she was okay. And that was a part of our young married life. She talked to her, she loved her, she tried to build her up, but eventually, despite it all, just days after our own daughter's first birthday, her mother took her own life. At that point, Erica went into very deep grieving, and she still feels the pain today. But at the age of 24, when that happened, she decided, even though my mother is no longer with me, I'm going to dedicate myself to helping other mothers know about Jesus Christ. We had written Tokyo at the time, and that became our older women's ministry in Tokyo, which I believe you have one here that uh, Anthony's mother leads, which is really excited. The G ministry or something like that? G squad, yeah. Well... It's awesome. You got an awesome G-Squad here. Our G-Squad in Tokyo was started by Erica, who was 24 years old at the time. And you know that older women's ministry in Tokyo? It continues to this day. When we go back there, they all gather around Erica. They're so excited to see her. And now they're, they can't believe that now she's a grandmother too. You know, even in Denver, she continues to study the Bible with other older women and especially other people's mothers. I remember this one older woman in Denver that she converted. She's Filipino, by the way. And uh, she, it was hilarious because she told her friends, when I study the Bible with Erica, I'm mesmerized by her beauty. <laughs> well, you know, several years after her mother's death, Erica's little brother, Hiroshi, who is her only sibling, he died in a car accident at the age of 30, leaving his widow and his little son, three-year-old son. The grief for Erica was overwhelming. We invited his widow and her son to come live with us. And they lived with us in Tokyo for several months and then stayed in the city in our church for a couple of years. And it was only a couple of months after they moved in that she studied the Bible and she was baptized. She married a disciple and today they're faithful and they have two children who've also been baptized and are also disciples. You know, Erica inherited her mother's, thank you, Eric inherited her mother's condition. It's genetic. She has lupus. And in her late 20s with two kids in Tokyo, her body completely broke down. She was bedridden for almost two years. I remember during that time, I used to have to carry her to the bathroom and carry her back to the bed. Our little children at the time were very small. And in order to spend time with Erica, they would literally climb in the bed and just read books and kind of hang out with her. That was their time with their mom. During those months and those years, what Erica did is, while she was in bed and she couldn't do much, physically, she translated our English songbook into Japanese. And decades later, today, if you go to church in Japan, they're still singing the songs that she translated. She would gather prayer requests from around the church, and she would pray for, pray for hours for the members of our congregation. And I am absolutely confident that her prayers did a lot more good for the church than any sermon or any lesson that I ever gave. You know, Erica's original picture of God when she was a college student, her picture of God's plan and her, his vision for her life, were very, very different. Were very, very different than what it turned out to be. Life did not turn out as she expected. But you know, when she looks back now, every piece makes 
since. She has written books and she speaks around the world on spirituality, on grief, on grace, and on healing. And tomorrow the sisters are going to be blessed by her teaching. She's written books and she receives emails from sisters in places like Atlanta, Fiji, Africa, and Europe about how her book has changed someone's life. Her daughters have all become disciples of Jesus. And every one of them will say that their mother is their living example of what faith really looks like during times of trial. Just recently, Erica told me something that moved my heart. She said, you know what? My illness is my friend. And I remember thinking, we spent our whole life fighting your illness. And now, you call it your friend? How? How can you say that? What makes you say that? I was amazed. But it was clear. She called her illness her friend because God had used it to make her life a masterpiece. An amazing work. A masterpiece that's full, and abundant, and lavished with grace and love and impact. So today, you're a masterpiece. You're God's work of art. You're a creation of his. And even your worst days and your best days, they're all important. And they're all an important part of the plan. So tonight, I leave you with this. Don't let your worst days make you numb. Do you know what I'm talking about? Where you show up, you go through the actions, but you don't feel the passion anymore. Don't let your worst days make you numb. Also, don't let your best days get you distracted. When all the great things are happening and so much good is happening in your life, and you forget the giver of every good thing. Remember that the good days and the bad days and every day are all a part of the true, abundant, overflowing, magnificent, opulent, lavish, incredible, significant life that God has called you to. For this is life, Jesus Christ. Thank you very much.